Our example here to start with is going to be parametric equations x equals f of t equals t, y equals g of t equals, I'm going to pick uh, two-thirds t to the three-halves power. Why such a strange little function? It's because it makes the, the math work out nicer if I do that. T greater than or equal to zero. It's going to be the domain. So we're going to start the motion at t equals zero. That's going to correspond to a parametric curve in vector form, r of t equals t comma two thirds t to the three halves, like that. Certainly the typical kinds of things that we've done with this should be something you should be able to do. You should be able to differentiate it to find the velocity vector as a function of t, it would be the vector whose components are one. And yeah, the two thirds and the three halves will cancel, giving you just t to the one half. That's why I did the strange example to make that second component of the velocity simple. The acceleration goes back to being a bit more complicated though. It's the derivative of the velocity, though its first component is zero, just zero. First component is simple. Second component's one half t to the negative one half. You should be able to, for the test, compute these. You should be able to draw them in a diagram. Maybe I have you draw the curve and have you draw a position vector at a certain moment in time and the velocity vector at that moment in time, and maybe even the acceleration vector. According to our standard conventions of putting the initial point to the tail of the position vector at the origin, so that its head, its tip is at the particle at that moment in time. Put the velocity vector and acceleration vector to be have their initial points at the particle's location. The velocity vector will be tangent to the curve and have a length equal to the speed. The acceleration vector could point in lots of different directions. Not necessarily perpendicular to the velocity vector, unless, like I talked about at the end of class on Wednesday, the velocity vector happens to be constant length constant speed, then the acceleration vector and or velocity vector end up being orthogonal or perpendicular to each other. What is the speed in this case? You should be able to compute that. Speed, it's a function of t in general. It is the magnitude of the velocity vector. And for this example, that's gonna be square root of one squared plus t to the one half squared. I just did the calculation in my head there um, by thinking about the Pythagorean theorem, but you should never ever forget, this is also the square root of the velocity vector dotted with itself. And that more generally, that kind of fact is true for any vector. Its magnitude is the square root of the vector dotted with itself. And therefore the square of the magnitude of any vector is the vector dotted with itself. A useful thing sometimes. What's the distance traveled? Also called arc length. I'm, I'm using notation a little different than the book does. I'm, I'm calling this a speed function for one thing of t. I also tend to use the notation dist of t for the distance traveled as a function of time. The book calls this S of t. I'm just going to say the dependent variable for this function is S. S does not mean speed. S means distance, arc length. It is maybe unfortunately the standard letter used for arc length. If I mean speed, I'll write speed. S equals dist of t is the integral of the speed from zero to t. We talked about this last time, say call it speed of tau d tau. But I'm not ruling out putting calculations like this on the test. Probably in a simpler situation though. So I have to integrate square root of one plus tau d tau. Is that doable? Yes, it is. And it's not too hard. You could even guess the answer. 
square root of one plus tau is the same as one plus tau to the one half power. You're gonna get one plus tau to the three halves power all over three halves, right? That's how you could guess the answer. Tau goes from zero to T. Simplify, dividing by three halves is the same as multiplying by two thirds. Plug in T for tau and then subtract what you get when you plug in zero for tau. And notice that's not zero. The distance traveled function, here we're subtracting really two thirds in the end. This is dist of t whose dependent variable I will be consistent with the book and call s. And notice that dist of zero, I started the motion at time zero, dist of zero is two thirds minus two thirds is zero. At time zero, I haven't gone any distance. Also notice that dist prime of t, which you could also write in Leibniz notation as ds dt, is, well, if you calculate it this way, you'll get one plus t to the one half, square root of one plus t, and that is the same as the speed function. We knew that that had to happen if we didn't make a mistake, because we defined the distance function as an integral with t in the upper limit. Fundamental theorem of calculus says when you do that, the derivative is the function you're integrating. We knew we had to get this, but you can also check it by looking at the formula. So this is, the, we've already talked about this to some degree, just another example of things we've already talked about. One thing new for today, that you should be able to think about in the context, again, of a simpler example. The book does another example in the first couple of pages of section 11.5, is you should, you should be able to use this to create what's called an arc length parameterization of the same parametric curve. So I'll say that again in a, here in a minute. What is the parametric curve in this context? Looks about like this. That's what the curve looks like. Motion is along that curve. In fact, since X equals T, you could say Y also equals not only two thirds T to the three halves, but two thirds X to the three halves. This curve is really the graph of Y equals two thirds X to the three halves. But it is a parametric curve. As time goes by, we're moving along this curve faster and faster, in fact, because that power of T is bigger than one the speed is an increasing function of t. So like the, the book does, I could plot individual points along here at equally spaced t values and they get further and further apart over time because the motion is faster and faster. Could I reparameterize this same curve so that each unit of time corresponds to one unit of distance. Yes, you can. That's called an arc length parameterization. And the key idea for how to do that is to take your distance traveled function and solve it for T in terms of S. Find its inverse function. Again, the book does this first couple pages of section 11.5 for a simpler example. If I test you on it, it'll be a simpler example. Doesn't look so simple to solve for T there, but I think it's possible. We could add two thirds to both sides first, then multiply both sides by three halves. Then I guess take the two thirds power of each side. Let's try it. S equals dist of T equals two thirds, one plus T to the three halves power minus two thirds. That means S plus two thirds is one plus, or two, is two thirds, one plus T to the three halves power, which means one plus T to the three halves power 
is three halves times s plus two thirds, which is three halves s plus one, raise both sides to the two thirds power to get rid of that three halves power. Then subtract one. T is this thing minus one. In other words, the inverse function of the distance traveled function as a function of the arc length parameter s is three halves s plus one to the two thirds power minus one. That's the inverse of the distance traveled function. I'm not done. What's the arc length parameterization then? The arc, here's the main principle. The arc length parameterization of the original parametric curve denoted R of S is found by taking the original formula for R right there and replacing each T with that thing. The original function has T in the first component. Replace that T with that thing. Three halves S plus one to the two thirds power minus one. The original R of T had in the second component, two thirds T to the three halves. Replace that T with this mess, three halves S plus one to the two thirds power minus one. That all gets raised to the three halves power. And there is your arc length parameterization. Yikes. But if I haven't made any mistakes, it should work. Let's check it in Mathematica. Is this really working the way I want it to work? Let's plug in the original function. I'm going to try to save some time by just plugging in right away here. T comma two thirds T to the three halves. The book calls this R of S, but I'm going to call it something different in mathematics. I'll call it R1 of S because I'm already using the letter R. Essentially, I'm just replacing T with this crazy thing, this, uh, this, Three, three halves S plus one to the two thirds power, all minus one. There it is. And if we've done it right, if we make a parametric plot of this R1 as a function of S, S going from say, I don't know, zero to five or something. If we're careful in looking at it, it should seem that it's traveling at one unit of distance per one unit of time, or it should at least seem like it's traveling at a constant speed. Play it when it's slow. I mean, you might argue it's hard to tell, but it should seem like that's a constant speed. It doesn't look like it's speeding up at least. The original R does speed up. So that might be difficult to tell as well. If I get rid of the one and make it the original R, that does speed up. I mean, it's going faster to begin with. Kind of looks like constant speed, but it really is speeding up. It's going faster and faster. Yeah, you can kind of tell. That's the original one. Not unit speed. If we wanted extra confirmation, we could uh, compute R1 dotted with itself. It's going to have a complicated formula, but that complicated formula is a bit deceiving. I don't know if Simplify will do it or not. Uh, Simplify doesn't really do it, but if I try to graph that, the, essentially the square of the speed with an ordinary plot. Uh, I guess I'm wrong. 
I must have made a mistake somewhere. I was expecting a horizontal line, a constant speed. So somewhere I made a mistake. I'm not sure what the mistake is. Um, I did give you the right idea for how to do this. Why is it important? The reason it's important will come up after the exam next week in the rest of the section is helping us define something called the curvature of the curve, which is, I think, a really cool subject. <laughs>